Hi, I'm Allison Pease, Associate to the Provost for Faculty at John Jay College. This episode represents the end of a year, let's call it season one, of interviews with professors at the college who have won our Distinguished Teaching Prize. In today's episode, I interviewed the 2016 winner of the prize, Crystal Lee Ensley. Professor Ensley is an assistant professor of Africana Studies who joined the college in 2013 and won the prize in 2016. I begin the interview by asking her what winning the prize meant to her. I was surprised and also um, it was it's it's really humbling, um, especially because I did not anticipate being nominated for it. I don't know. So so to be recognized by your relationship with your students or what they're learning from you. Um, it's, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. And it was, it was rewarding in a way that, um, you don't expect to teaching is So it's intangible, right? Learning is mostly into, you know, you produce something at the end of the process of it. Sometimes you don't know, um, if you're, if you're doing any good, but I think to to be there to have a moment of recognition, to be recognized by a, a committee um, of people who had been here and had the experience and all, you know, by my students and then by this committee too, it just um, um, it, it felt it felt great, you know. <laughs> You're a professor in Africana Studies. Mm -hmm. You have a PhD Mm -hmm. in Women's Studies and Curriculum and Instruction. Mm -hmm. How would you describe your area of expertise? Um, So I'm going to go back a little bit further than the PhD. My undergraduate degree is in theater. Um, And so when I went to grad school... um, there's a part, I come from a working class background, so there's a part of me of, of like, making the most. So, like, how many degrees can I get for the cost of tuition? Um, and so that's part of the reason for the dual title. Um, I also had an excellent advisor um, who was, uh, what's it called, joint appointment between the College of Education and the Women and Gender Studies program at Penn State. And so my emphasis in curriculum and instruction, they, there were all these branches that you could do, um, and mine was language and literacy education. Mm-hmm. Um, and so combining it's very interdisciplinary right already even though at the time I didn't know to say I have an inner this is a very interdisciplinary field of scholarship that I'm going into but I look at performance I look at pedagogy um from a critical feminist feminisms of color sort of perspective and how performance can help us work towards social justice and I believe that education and performance are really parallel fields anyway. Um, How so? Because, okay, when you're, okay, if we if we look at, are you, Augusto Boal, the theater of the oppressed, so he was good buddies with Frary, right? So critical pedagogy, um, which understands the process of learning and teaching as an exchange, right? Mm-hmm. It's transactional. It's not a deposit from an expert into an empty vessel, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and Boal, for his for his theater and performance of the oppressed, um, he, he believes that performance should be understood in the same way. It's not, you're not a spectator, right? Laura Mulvey is a feminist um, critic who, sure. for film. Um, and she's, you know, she says, you know, your audience is, we want to believe we're spectators and like, mm-hmm. oh, we're just watching this, we've got the peeping Tom sort of thing. Um, but but wow says Mm-mm, any sort of performance you're automatically co-constructing that performance right you know and so, so same is true in that classroom those students are co-constructing whatever knowledge gets produced i'm i'm the expert but i'm not the only expert in the room and so my job as both an artist performing artist and as a as a teacher is to kind of call that up out of the students and out of the audience at the same time. And so for me, spoken word poetry 
as an as a performing artist, that's the best tool. That's the best vehicle for me to do that there. Mm -hmm. um, and so, it's a it's a lot of a lot of collaboration happening in both of those spaces. So that's mm -hmm. what I mean when I say that that to me they're already working in the same kinds of ways. We don't rescind our statements. We don't expect you to understand if your vision ain't there yet. And yes, times do get hard. And I still hit my knees, call out to Almighty God. He told me, girl, get up, get dressed, put your good shoes on because the war is not over. You gotta love all of my people no matter where they are from that freestyle cypher on the corner to the rising academic superstar. Use your words to remind them who they are and like soft velvet gloves over brass knuckles, baby, we hit hard. Surprise, we go far across the spectrum of a lyrical refrain. Honey, this is what you get when you mix Cornell West with Lil Wayne. Malcolm X meets Queen Elizabeth's reign. Your book, Open Mic Night, Campus Programs That Champion College Student Voice and Engagement, mm -hmm. was recently awarded an American Educational Research Association Outstanding Collection in Curriculum Studies. Um, the book makes the case that spoken word develops political agency mm -hmm. in young adults, mm -hmm. particularly among those from traditionally marginalized communities. You are a spoken word artist yourself. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me how you use spoken word in your teaching? Sometimes I do, but not in every single class. I think that's important to to make make pretty clear. Um, so spoken word is an officially sort of related to hip hop culture, right? So there are four elements of hip hop culture: um, the b boy, the graffiti artist, the MC, and the DJ. Um, and there is sort of a a uh, an unofficial fifth element, which is knowledge of self, um, with the understanding that like if you, once you know yourself, then you can know everything else better, right? Um, and that participating in any of those elements or any combination of those elements of hip hop assists young folks in knowing themselves. And so for me, spoken word poetry is how you gain the best knowledge of self, period. So my, my, my first book um, was called The Fifth Element. So that's where that came from, The Fifth Element, Knowledge of Self, Spoken Word Poetry as Social Justice Pedagogy. And so with, in the classroom, in my arts and culture classes, we, we really look, because there's such a long history, like this is, Deaf Poetry Jam is wonderful, um, but it, it was not the first, you know, I love Russell Simmons to a degree, but it's like, this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. this is not, you yeah. are not the first. Um, glad it's more mainstream, love and hate relationship with that. But um, but there is such a long history of oral tradition um, in so many cultures around the world. And so in, in my classrooms, what I've found so far is that even, even getting students to um, examine their own their own core values, what they believe in, understanding and being able to define what culture is, and then getting them to perform makes a huge difference. A lots of times there are very um, visceral reactions to performing or presenting. Lots of times students are terrified. You know, they don't want to get in front of the class. They don't want to share anything too personal, you know, because we are in New York City and we are New Yorkers and it's, you know, you got to put on the... Put on the face, you know, <laughs> put on the front here. Um, but once they once they reach a, a, that point um, and they're willing to to understand also that what they produce, what they share when they perform, the responsibility is on them, but it's not just on them. It's on the, our social responsibility as a class, right? Mm -hmm. It's that community, it's that audience member, it's the call and response, the call and the responsibility that we have, like... What, what does it do to us to listen to someone's version of history that directly contradicts with the dominant narrative of history? You know, what does it do to, what does it do to us to listen to um, the undocumented student who shares um, how proud she is of her parents who came to this country without any official papers, um, and now she's, you know, first-generation college student. What does that do to us, particularly in this political climate, you know? And so trying to trying to get them to that point, sometimes it takes, <laughs> it takes, it takes a lot. And a lot of times there are students who will come to, um, you know, we've had uh, um, open mics outside of 
outside of the class, like in, during community hour or through faculty student engagement funds, yay. Or working with the Center for Student Involvement and Leadership, they've been very supportive too, to bring in artists, to host open mics, all of that good stuff. Um, and so once students, if students will take that chance and attend or perform or share something we've worked on in class in this public space, then I get to see a transformation in them back in the classroom in a different way. The Shaolin Temple and the clan of Wu-Tang, I do my thing. I am one half master, one half runaway slave. I am Pecos Bill Paul, bunny meets Apache Indian brave. I will scalp you just to get to your brain. So if there is a flesh wound, then you find yourself in pain. I'm Professor X, or you could just call me the doctor. I am Lena Horn, you play the doctor. You mentioned community. Yeah. It's actually something that your students write about when they write about you as a professor. They say that you make the classroom feel like a community. Hmm. What do you do to promote that? At the beginning of each semester, like in a very practical way, yeah. at the beginning of each <laughs> class, no matter which class it is, um, we, we set community rules. Hmm. So I don't come in with the syllabus with the rules listed, um, but we set them in one of the first couple of classes and together. So these are all of our agreements. Everybody has a chance. We do a big chart paper or write on, write on the board. What are we all willing to commit to? Lots of times it's things like respect, um, or listening, um, or arguing the idea, not the person. Um, and then I, I also really try to emphasize that everybody comes from a different social location. Everybody's in a different context. Everybody's approaching what we're going to learn from a different place. And so we have to, we've got to make room for that. we got to negotiate those very opposite, sometimes very binary lived experiences mm -hmm. um, to, to understand something. And the way we do that is through course materials, because that's the one thing we'll all have in common, right? Are the readings or the videos or whatever the materials are. Um, so trying to get them to bring that lived experience, but also make room for um, make room for another person's perspective who hasn't hasn't had the luxury or the privilege um, or the pain or the experience that you have had, and and how that might make them see the world differently. Um, so those community rules really help me because then it's as, as simple as reminding them like y'all said at the beginning of the semester like this is what we would do so I try to I try to do that um when we do present when we do perform only positive feedback it sounds basic but I try to be very enthusiastic in my verbal feedback because mm -hmm. I I perform better when I get feedback yeah um so if it's only positive feedback mm -hmm. how do they improve questions questions so once they perform right once you've got your kid up there for the first time sharing their sharing their poem that they wrote or presenting on a topic and they hate presenting in front of or responding verbally to a question in class so I, I, I really um enthusiastically say I am so glad that you spoke up about trying to really encourage them to practice articulating their thoughts even if they come out come out in a jumble you know, and reminding everybody, like, this is like a freestyle. This is like your, this is your rough draft a lot of times, what you share. Like, we are always constantly revising ourselves, and that's okay. It's a process, you know. And then, so so typically, after, after a performance or after a presentation, I task specific students with giving one piece of positive feedback. Like, what, what did you hear that you either really responded to or really liked or really compelled you? And then a question. I, I read one one time, Jessica, I don't know if I'm going to say her last name correctly, Jessica Hagedorn, Hagedorn mm -hmm, mm -hmm. said that the job of the artist is not to uh, provide the answers. The job of the artist is to provoke the questions. Mm. So that, like, it was like, who shivers for me when I read <laughs> that, you know, because I thought, oh, what a relief. Like, right. you know, <laughs> what a relief. And so I try to, and so I try to also, as I as I teach, even if it's, if it's not an arts-based class, like, just what are what are questions what are how can what questions can i ask you that will help you kind of get to the core and help me understand or to clarify your point um or to improve like you said um so that's i guess one tactic 
The other thing that your students also say about you most often is that you're inspirational. <laughs> what do you hope to inspire students to do? To have courage. To have courage, I think. I don't think... Um, because I think courage can take a lot of different forms. I don't believe everybody's a poet. <laughs> I don't. I think you can, everyone can write poetry, but I don't think everybody's calling is to be a, some great poet. Um, but whether it's to be a computer programmer or to be a mama or to whatever they want to pursue, to have courage in the pursuit of that. Because mm -hmm. um, you'll feel fear I feel fear every time it's the beginning of a new semester. Like every time, every time before I get on stage somewhere or go to give a talk or go, I'm always, I'm, there's sweat going down my back. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, you feel that, but then you, you push, you push through it. Um, and so that would be my, that would be my hope because if then, if they can have, if they, if they can have courage, then even if they get rejected or even if they mess up or there's failure, They'll, they'll persist. Can you tell me what a typical Crystal Ensley class period looks like, mm. if there is such a thing? Mm. I can tell you some things that you might find across several class periods if that's okay that's um good. try to I try to vary it I um because I get bored <laughs> and if I'm bored then mm. I know they're suffering but I like I really like um to have students write in class mm -hmm. um I like in class writing because then um I believe it draws them into this space you know I try to get them to view class not as a obligation or one more thing they have to go sit through because they signed up for it but as a you get an hour and 15 minutes to be here with each other in this moment in time what can we do you know so I find if, if I have a writing prompt um at the start of class that usually gets everybody in a space we can be present in the space um there you will t you will typically find a song. I like to include music. You play music. I sometimes? play I play a song sometimes while they're while they're writing. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes a song that um, relates to the theme or the topic of the book or the. Um, for example, we um, I had the privilege of teaching the cross-listed um, AFR ART two twenty four the African American women. Professor Collins' um, class, African American Women in Art, mm. um, and so she really dives into um, the, these these four stereotypes that just show up in visual art and, and across culture. And so I play Nina Simone's Four Women. Look at that, right? And so um, that song we played repeatedly over the course of the semester, just to see, like, okay, how do we look at it now? How do we... So it deepens. Exactly. Oh. So at the beginning, we're, we listen to it, and we're there. And a lot of these students, some of them have heard of Nina Simone, but they've heard of her because she's been part of a remix of a Common song or a Kanye West song. You know, she's been sampled all over. Yeah. Um, she's been on a Pringles commercial. You know what I mean? I mean, they yeah, know, they recognize everywhere. her voice. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I use, I use that as an entry point um, into into the the theory into into the analysis of the art like you know it's never as simple as we think that it it might be at first or um into ourselves how can we be reflexive about what what we're learning is, is this still relevant is it still happening how does it relate to us now um so yeah so that's that's one that's one way a song perhaps some in-class writing. Um, you'll find probably some pairs or some small group activities. Mm -hmm. um, then, then that they are then responsible for sharing out with the rest of the class. Um, what you typically, occasionally, you'll find some lecture, but I try never to lecture an entire class. Um, 
but a lot of times if there's historical content, um, then I think that that's a good, it's another good grounding, kind of grounding point. Um, Mm -hmm. And lots of discussion, lots of discussion. Um, So sometimes I'll come up with questions ahead of time. Um, Sometimes I'll, there will be a student responsible for facilitating the class um, and that gets us going. Um, Or, you know, they get random randomly selected <laughs> to to share um their insights but i try to keep i try to vary the types of engagement because not not every student just because a student isn't speaking in class doesn't mean that they're not you know i try to allow for the different types of learning what is a go-to teaching or learning technique that you know mm-hmm. if i do this students can't fail to learn mm-hmm. or engage Hmm. I I think it's the in class writing. There there is a there's one activity um that deals with identity that asks students there are different identity cards and it asks them it says things like hometown or age or political affiliation, typical ethnicity, gender, however they identify and I get them to write that down. And then I ask them to arrange those cards, those different categories, in a list in the order in which they they think they are perceived by others. Interesting. So they'll actually, and it's this is it sounds like a small thing, but I actually give them like I cut out the cards so they have to physically arrange it's that whole embodiment thing right mm-hmm. <laughs> they have to physically arrange into a hierarchy how they are perceived by others how they think they are perceived by other people so they do that and then they write the list and then I ask them to take those same categories and arrange them in order of importance um, to who they are mm-hmm. so of course a lot of times the thing at the bottom goes to the top they write that they rearrange and then they write that list down and then we i give them some time to to write about each list and then we talk about it and what's the discovery for students when you do that oh students who did not i think the i think my most the best part about it for me is that they discover something about each other. Oh. Like, oh, I would have never... If I, if I hear you tell me something about what you experienced when you first walk in a room, I'm like, oh. And then I got to go look at my list and be like, did I have the same things down? Mm. Why or why not? I'm comparing... The mm. students are learning about themselves by learning about each other. It's back to that knowledge yeah. of self, right? Yeah. Learning about myself because I'm learning about you. And then what does it mean for the two of us to be in the same class at the same time in 2018? Yeah. Learning the same material. And then they they find out what matters most. They have to decide what matters most to them. Because without a doubt, somebody's going to put their hand up and say, well, what if I have three categories that tie? No, no. No, 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 no. Right? For the for the sake of this exercise, and then we could talk about intersectionality later, but for the sake of this exercise, if you had to prioritize, what would it what would it be? How would you do that? Um it's always a very um sobering class. Yeah. You know? Um but it, it gives me a point of reference for if I'm if I'm teaching art. Africana, our intro to Africana studies class, a point of reference. We're talking about all these historical things, these global things that started over the same reasons, the same concepts of privilege or the same concepts of power, you know, that you go through was, was happening on the other side of the world hundreds of years ago, or, you know, try, trying to make those kinds of connections to larger moments or movements or systems um but that that always helps me to because they remember that you know they remember that that activity and go back to the, oh yeah oh yeah mm-hmm. you know <laughs> in the spirit of making small adjustments to our teaching that can positively affect mm-hmm. student learning is there one small thing, or at least thing that you think of as a small thing that you do, 
that you think if somebody listening to this podcast could do, they mm. might positively affect student learning? Mm. Um, two, two little small things come right to my mind. Um, I ran a little experiment last, last semester and in one of my classes that was not performance related at all, um, I started each class period with the lights off. I had everyone who was physically able to stand up and we just took several really deep breaths together um every single class I started in that way um and the difference that it made for them um (laughs) the difference that it made for them and for me just to just to pause for one moment and breathe deeply together Mm. and to just um, I would I would sometimes after that have everyone go around the room and say, okay, um, tell me one thing you're um, you're feeling gratitude about, and just give me one word, and then everybody would just quickly go around. It takes it takes three minutes, you know, um, but it does it serves to me the same purpose as that in class writing right at the start of right at the start of the class to to bring us all into the space to acknowledge that we're here together. I'm gonna I'm gonna show up for you, so you show up for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it also, again, makes us really aware of our bodies. Yeah. Where, where are you feeling tension right now? What, why do you think that is? Are you nervous? Are you anxious? Can we let that go? Can we clear a little, you know, and so also to remind them, like, I, I see you as students. I know we're here to do work. Um, but I value you as a person and I value myself mm-hmm. as a person too, mm-hmm. you know? So if we could take just a, just a few minutes, just and I think it's something about doing that right at the start of class, mm-hmm. too, to say this comes before anything else. This comes first. Let's let's take three minutes to take care of ourselves, just to calm down, to focus, to be here, um, take care to to model self care, and to also say, hey, I care about you too. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> mm-hmm. and that, I think it makes a big. I think it shifts. Yeah. You know, I think it can shift. It's a small thing. Yeah. Um, but I had a lot of students after that class tell me that that was one of their, I do like a little self-check, like a little informal, not the uh, evaluation thing, but a little informal, just like, okay, thing you loved, thing you hated, thing I can improve on for this particular class. And so many of them wrote down, I loved the breathing exercise <laughs> at the beginning of class. And I thought if I can do that one little thing, right. it didn't cost me nothing, you know? Right. It didn't cost us anything at all to, to do that. Um, and I think it, it, particularly for our student body, working jobs, hustling, and bustling. And Carrying things. a lot of stress, That's moving it. from thing to thing. That's it. And just to pause, just to have one moment of silence. Yeah. One, just... Like what? It, what is that sound? You know, what is the sound of that? <laughs> we New Yorkers don't know. What that is. <laughs> you know, um, and then to say, okay, cool. Now, now let's go to work. Now I feel better about about doing that too. Um, but I think that's the main thing, and I think this, um, the second little, the little thing about um, improving is sometimes, um, like I said, I do the little informal check ins. Um, So just on a scrap of paper with no name, I'll have them um, fold it in half and then start, stop, and continue. What should we start doing? What should we stop doing? What should we continue doing in this class? They do it for the class and they do it for themselves. So they're thinking, yeah, they're thinking about me. But again, if 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 this is performance pedagogy, if we're exchanging... I'm not the only one responsible for your experience in this class. Mm -hmm. So it's accountability too, right? That's the role of the audience and that's the role of the artist. We're calling each other into account for what we learn or what we produce through this class today. So how can I help improve this course and how can you improve what you're contributing?
I love when they can come somewhere else and be in a totally new environment. Um, but even bringing, bringing, um, I brought Tony Keith, spoken word artist, co-author of, of that uh, other book here to campus. He came, he did a class workshop and then he hosted the open mic. And so the students got exposed to it, even if they couldn't attend the extracurricular things. And I think that, um, trying to incorporate those, those types of bridging, bridging the, the academic and the home community is really, really critical. I think it's really, really critical. Um, cause it's, then it's about who are you serving? Who are you in service to? How, how is what you're doing in the ivory tower connected to the city that you live in? You know, how do you, um, how do you make it worthwhile? You know? Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think that's the only other thing that I would say. <laughs> Crystal Ensley, winner of the John Jay Distinguished Teaching Prize of 2016. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Yeah.